Welcome to Corporate Warrior, the podcast that brings you the best advice on how to improve your health, optimize performance, and maximize productivity with your host, Lawrence Neal. This episode is brought to you by ARX, the most innovative, efficient, and effective all-in-one exercise machines I have ever seen. I was really impressed with my ARX workout. The intensity and adaptive resistance was unlike anything I've ever experienced. I love how the machine enables you to increase the negative load to fatigue target muscles more quickly. And I love how the workouts are effortlessly quantified. The software tracks maximum force output, rate of work, total amount of work done and more in front of you on screen, allowing you to compete with your previous performance to give you and your clients real-time motivation. The ARX uses a computer-controlled motor to give you the exact amount of resistance your clients need 100% of the time. This means that the resistance can never become dangerous, is intuitive and simple to use, and can provide you with all of the results you and your clients are looking for in a fraction of the time. ARX is highly effective and efficient in delivering all of the benefits of exercise, including increased strength, muscle mass, cardiovascular conditioning, bone mineral density, and injury recovery. As well as being utilized by many high-intensity trainers to deliver highly effective and efficient workouts to their clients, ARX comes highly recommended by world-class trainers and brands, including Bulletproof, Tony Robbins, and Ben Greenfield Fitness. To find out more about ARX and get $500 off install when you place an order, please go to arxfit.com and mention Corporate Warrior and How Did You Hear About Us field. So again, to get $500 off install when you order, head on over to arxfit.com and enter Corporate Warrior and How Did You Hear About Us field. Hi guys, I am Lawrence Neal and welcome to another episode of Corporate Warrior, the podcast that shows you how to optimize your health and get the most out of your high intensity training and start and grow your hit business. My former guests include the who's who in high intensity training, like Dr. Doug McGuff, Drew Bay and Jim Flanagan, health, fitness and nutrition giants like Mark Sisson and Rob Wolf, successful high intensity training entrepreneurs and exercise scientists like Luke Carson, Adam Zickerman, Dr. James Fisher, Dr. James Steele, and many, many more. This podcast is also brought to you by the Hit Business Membership. It's an online blueprint that I've designed to help you grow your hit business, including exclusive content on sales, marketing, hiring, pricing, retention, and personal training, monthly Q&As with experts and the best in the industry, and high-grade community full of thought leaders and high-intensity training business owners. If you're interested in joining, please go to corporatewarrior.co forward slash membership. My guest today is Dr. Jürgen Giesing. You can email Jürgen over at Giesing, G-I-E-S-S-I-N-G at uni-landau.de. Uh, and if you can't remember that, please go to corporatewarrior.co forward slash Jürgen, J-U-R-G-E-N. And obviously the email will be listed there as well if you want to get in touch with him. So after completing obligatory military service from 1987 to 1988, Jürgen studied at the University of Marburg and the Thames Valley University in London. After graduating from the University of Marburg with a teaching degree and a doctor's degree in pedagogy, hopefully I've said that Correctly, in 1997, he worked as a sports therapist and PE teacher and continued his research about muscle hypertrophy training, which led to his doctoral dissertation in sports science at the University of Tübingen in 2002. Again, hopefully I'm pronouncing these words correctly. Since 2007, Jürgen works as a professor of sports science at the University of Koblenz-Landau, which he can, where he continues his research about muscle hypertrophy training and its health-related effects. His book, HIT, first published in 2006, became a bestseller in Germany. And his new book, High Intensity Training, How to Build Muscles in Minutes, Fast, Efficient and Healthy, explains why staying in shape requires very little training time. And it is the quality rather than the quantity of training that makes the difference. I absolutely love this book. Um, Jürgen was very kind enough to send me a copy in advance of our podcast. It makes for a very effective introduction to high intensity training or a very nice addition to your hip bookshelf. It's got a ton of high intensity training routines inside to help you construct and refine your own workouts, which I found very useful for myself. 
Professor Giesing has conducted several studies on high intensity training with sports students, seniors ranging from 60 to 80 years of age, type 2 diabetics, and identical twins with a total of several hundred subjects. To this day, there has never been an injury related dropout in any of these studies, which just shows how safe high intensity training is. This was a real treat for me since I've followed Jurgen's work for quite a while.、Um, Jurgen is obsessed with high intensity training and muscle hypertrophy. So, if you want to learn all about that, which I'm sure you do, you will love this episode. And in addition, we get into all things high intensity training. I mean, everything, including the origins of multiple set training and how、uh, Jurgen did the research to kind of figure out that multiple set training was a little bit superfluous and, and why he discovered you know, high intensity training made more sense. We talk about calorie intake for muscle gain, which is particularly interesting. The utility of drop sets, training frequency, how to know if your poor or stagnating performance is due to lack of recovery or sticking points or fill in the blank. And we talk about much, much more than that. We really do cover many, many aspects of high intensity training from someone who really is、um, at the top of the field in this regard.、Uh, one thing I will mention is、um, I do want to correct something I said. I talk about my low calorie intake in this one, which actually is not correct.、Um, I realized that I wasn't really measuring it correctly. I wasn't really factoring in a lot of the fat I have in my diet, which, as we know, is, is very calorically dense and easy to underestimate.、Uh, but actually, I, I, I've been known for saying, you know, I was eating around 1,800 calories. But I think it's, what's more accurate is I was probably eating more around、um, 22 to 2,500 a day and probably closer to 2,500.、Um, and so, you know, kind of. Makes sense in that, you know, I'd be eating to say Thai tea. And to be honest, for my weight and size,、um, you know, that kind of amount of calories would be probably required in order to, you know, satiate me.、Um, so I just wanted to correct that. And one other thing is this was published in July. So, Jurgen, I apologize for the delay.、Um, and to those listening, please bear that in mind、uh, in the context of the recent episodes that I've published as well.、Um, and without any further ado, very, very excited to bring you this one. I give you Dr. Jurgen Giesing. Jurgen, welcome to the show. Pleasure to have you on. My pleasure, Lawrence. Thank you for having me. Now, you are most welcome. And thank you so much for obviously sending me a copy of your book, High Intensity Training. I really enjoyed reading that. And、uh, obviously, that prompted a lot of questions for me、um, for this, this interview of you. So, very excited to ask you a whole bunch of stuff that's been on my mind、um, and also talk a little about your research.、Um, I think one of the things I wanted to start with is talking about this concept of multiple sets, which I've never heard it written about so.、Um, Uh, in such detail in your book, in terms of how that became popular. Could you just elaborate on that and talk, talk to the audience about you know, why we kind of default to multiple sets in training? Yeah, the question, or the, the, let's say the, the point why I started to deal with this question was that when I was、um, writing my、uh, master's thesis as a student, Um, I was looking for empirical evidence for、um, how to train for muscular hypertrophy, how many sets, which exercises, and so on. And especially the question of how many sets are ideal for hypertrophy was very stunning because all I read in the magazines and all I was told in the gyms was that three sets of 10, that was the best method of、uh, going for hypertrophy. And I was scanning through the、um, library and not finding anything, not finding any piece of evidence or anything that said, that really proved or that, that the only study that I found was the now famous Berger study from 1962, which came to the conclusion that six sets of 10 were the best、uh, way to train for hypertrophy. And frankly, the quality of that study. Is not that that you could say, well, this is really convincing. And what else was striking to me was that in that study, there was one result that said that two, no, no, pardon, one set of an exercise produced more hypertrophy than two sets. And the difference between one set and three sets, they were tiny. 
And of course, there was no statistical um, significance or anything. So I kept dealing with that question and uh, kept looking for all the information I could get. And what I found all the time was there is no evidence. Um, interestingly enough, most of the scientists who could not find the difference between one set and two or three or five sets, they looked at the bodybuilders and then they always say, well, there must be something concerning volume because look at what the bodybuilders are doing. They are gaining so much muscle and they are usually doing at least three sets of an exercise. Okay. And uh, so that's funny because um, the bodybuilders should be the ones who look at science and not the scientists should be the ones who look at the bodybuilders. Um, and another thing is that in the past, I mean, it's not surprising that there are or that there were not so many studies that dealt with the question how many sets or what kind of volume would be best for hypertrophy because athletes in the past, let's say up to 1970, um, they were looking for training methods that did not produce hypertrophy because at that time it was believed that muscle makes you muscle bound, makes you slow, makes you stiff, all these, you know, cliches. Um, and the argument was, look at the, the, the high jumper. He has to take all that muscle weight over the bar. And uh, the football players, they have to carry the weight. And so we look for training methods that produce not so much hypertrophy. And then 1980, something, when people started to, to – when thousands of people joined gyms, you know, after pumping iron and after this fitness craze – um, people were approaching the gyms and asking, what can I do for hypertrophy? And there was no scientific base at that time. And so people said, well, do what the bodybuilders do, three sets of 10. And so this has, passed, has been passed on and on and on. And it has not been questioned in the way that it should have been. And when you look at it, all the studies that we have and the, the well-conducted studies, they give us some convincing results that says if you take one set to failure, then additional sets will not produce much or even nothing at all, which goes beyond that what you get from one set. And the problem I have with all these uh, meta-analysis and everything is that they compare, compare apples to oranges or something, you know, because they say, um, well, which is, <clears throat> sorry, which is better, one set or two sets or three sets? Well, first of all, we have to look at the most important aspect, and that is intensity of effort. Because if I do not fatigue a muscle in my first set, then the second set may indeed be necessary. Because um, let's say if, if one set doesn't produce a result because I don't give it all I have, if your body, if the muscle, if the system does not have a reason to adapt, then it won't adapt. Because when you look at evolution, muscle growth only occurred when it was really necessary and not when, not for aesthetic reasons or anything, because having more muscle meant that you needed to eat more and that you needed to hunt more. And it was a problem at some times, you know? Um, so your body really, really needs a, a strong stimulus before it starts to um, react or to adapt in terms of muscle hypertrophy. And you can get, I mean, it has been proven many times that you can get this effect with one set per exercise. Um, I've, been doing a class at my university where we have about 20 students every semester who follow a high intensity workout once a week, 10 exercises, uh, one set to failure, training only once a week, no other strength training during that time. And what we see is, let's say close to 80% gain muscle from that. And, uh, so I've, and we've done other studies where we have had our subjects only do one set to failure and they've gained muscle. So I've seen it hundreds, literally hundreds of times that it's possible to gain muscle with doing one high intensity set of an exercise once a week. 
Now, question is, could you gain more if you drained two or three days a week or if you added more volume? And that's another aspect that I think needs more um, consideration because obviously volume is another factor. But people who talk about volume, uh, you know, advanced trainees need more volume and so on. Okay, but what about uh, the thing? It, does it really make sense after doing, let's say, one set of bench presses or one set of, of barbell curls, because I'm advanced and need more volume, do another set of the same exercise, do a third set of the same exercise. When we talk about increasing volume, doesn't it make much more sense to add another exercise? Because even a very primitive muscle like the biceps has several functions. You have flexion of the elbow, you have supination of the hand, just to name two. So instead of doing two sets of barbell curls, you should, if you try to increase your volume, you should use another exercise. Take one set, one exercise to failure, and then choose another exercise that makes the muscle um, apply another function that it has and go to failure on that one too. So in this example, you do a set of barbell curls to failure. Then you do a set of supination um, or dumbbell curls with supination because then you have stressed the muscle um, in two of its functions. And it's, when you look at the back muscles, you have the latissimus, the, the trapezius and everything. So it's impossible, in my opinion, to train your whole back with only one exercise. You need an exercise uh, for your lats, for your trapezius. I mean, if you do deadlifts or anything, well, that covers most of it. If you say you do squats, deadlifts, and uh, some kind of press, you train your whole body, obviously. But, you know, um, what I'm trying to say is instead of doing more and more of the same, we should add different kinds of stimulation if we are looking for increases in volume. Yeah, no, I, that was really interesting, Jürgen. Sorry, I thought you were going to say something extra then, so apologies for the pause. Um, but a couple of things you said there, which I just want to touch on because I found found it really interesting, is um, going back to your point regarding the meta-analysis. Um, mm -hmm. So in summary, you, f you feel that, and I guess we're talking about the, the most recent meta-analysis, which I think came out in the last year or two, uh, um, which was trying to demonstrate that multiple sets were more effective than single sets. Um, the problem is that they're not controlling for effort in these studies, um, amongst other variables. And I guess the counter argument to that is, well, there's enough studies that we don't need to necessarily control for that. That's the whole point of a meta-analysis. But you, you feel that it's still... It's still not very. It's still not very good evidence for why uh, multiple sets are more effective than single sets. It's still these things still need to be controlled better, even in a meta analysis. Is that is that fair? Absolutely. I think um, when you look at the meta analysis, when you look at the studies they threw into it, then you see usually in met when you look at medicine, you, you look at all the studies that compared people taking this kind of medicine or medication and people not taking this kind of medication, but not taking anything else. And the problem is with, uh, with the studies uh, on, on uh, multiple or single set training is you've got so many different variables. There were studies with males and females, old and young, uh, experienced, uh, not experienced lifters. Um, the, the breaks between the sets were different. Um, the, the number of uh, workouts per week were different. And the most important point, intensity of effort was not controlled for. I give you an example. Um, usually when you read uh, studies, then it always says subjects um, did so and so many sets to failure. You know? and then when you go to, to conferences, and uh, I sometimes, if I meet the, the colleagues, the scientists who, who publish the studies, then I, if I get the chance, I always ask them, you wrote that your subject um, trained to failure. What does it mean? What does it mean exactly? And then you get all kinds of answers. One scientist said, well, we told subjects to um, see what they could do, whatever that means. Another one said, um, 
we tried, uh, we, we told subjects to stop the set when they no longer felt comfortable with it. Another set, um, we went to failure. That means additional repetitions were not possible, even if they tried. And that's the point. I mean, how can you know if this was really, let's say you do, do 10 sets, uh, sorry, 10 uh, reps of a certain exercise. How can you know if that really was your repetition maximum if you do not, let's say after the 10th, try to do the 11th rep? Because most people might succeed. And that's the point. I mean, how can you really know if people train to failure if they do not try to do another additional repetition? I give you an example. After I published my first study on high-intensity training in German, there was um, a reporter from a TV station who wanted to make a, a report on that. And they visit, the whole team visited me in the gym, and I explained the concept of training to failure to them and so on. And then the reporter was a young woman, maybe 30 years of age. She said, she said I've been working out for 10 years now, and... Um, I would like to try that. Show me what training to, to failure means. And then she said, oh, we, we've got the same kind of equipment uh, at my gym. So I said, okay, let's try that. What, which weight do you usually use for this exercise? And it was a rowing exercise. And she said, oh, so and so many kilograms. And so she warmed up. And after a break, she said, I'm ready. Um, I, t I told her to use the weight that she usually does for 10 repetitions. And she did. And after the ninth repetition, she said, this is where I would usually stop. And, it, and I said, no, 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 go on, go on, go on. And I encouraged her and made sure she, she didn't stop. Guess how many repetitions she's, she did. After, after the ninth repetition, she, she said she was done. Um, after the ninth repetition, she said she was done. Right. Yeah. Oh, oh, but you told her to continue. Sorry. Is that what exactly. You yeah. Uh, 15. 22. <laughs> she, did, she did 22 repetitions with a weight that she believed was a 10 repetition maximum. Right. And that after training for 10 years. And um, I mean, that's not a typical example, but it happens. Yeah. And some people misjudge their repetition maximum, maybe only by one or two repetitions, but that's still a lot. I mean, let's say you do... You think you can do eight, but you find you, you end up doing 10. I mean, percentage-wise, that's a lot. And so if we, I mean, I have no problem comparing and doing meta-analysis meta and comparing all kinds of studies, one set, two sets, three sets, but then it must be under conditions which can be really compared not compare one thing to something else that isn't comparable. And so all it comes down to is if you do one set properly, you do not need another set of the same exercise. And which is it, something I find interesting is that even the proponents of multiple set training, um, they don't say that doing two sets or three sets is uh, twice as good as doing one set. I mean, we're talking about a few percent here. And so, I mean, doing three times the amount of, of um, work for getting maybe a benefit of three additional percent for Olympians or something, that's a lot, of course, three percent or five percent or ten percent. But imagine um, you're working, I don't know, 40 hours a week. And your boss says, how about doing three times as much for 10% more salary? Most people would not do that. But in the gym, they do that. In the gym, they do. But um, as I said before, if you want to increase your training volume, do one set, give it all you've got, and then choose another exercise and go to failure on that exercise too. So... I guess, is it fair to say that um, the meta-analysis could be more useful if the sample sizes were larger and the studies were actually controlled for intensity of effort better um, and maybe there were more studies in the overall sample 
that are of higher quality, that would then make for maybe some useful data points. Is that, is that a fair yeah. statement? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I think because the issue is, is um, and I'm just as much to blame for this as anyone else, is a lot of non-scientists um, and um, quote-unquote experts will, you know, look at a meta-analysis, read the abstract, and just pull conclusions from that and not look at the study design. And, and it's especially if it agrees with their preconceived notions, they're likely to just go with it, right? <laughs> Yeah, um, absolutely. Which is which is uh, which is very unproductive. <laughs> but uh, you know, it's it's uh, with information overwhelm. I also understand why people might might uh, opt to do that. Uh, it's, it's challenging. Um, but but no, thank you, Jürgen. That was actually really really. I, I understand now much better as to why why there may be um, some real flaws there um, and why we have to take it with a pinch of salt. Uh, I'm certainly uh, obviously as you know a proponent of a single set of failure in most cases, um, especially when it comes to muscle hypertrophy. Now on that subject, one of the things you said just now was um, you don't see why people do a second set. Rather, it'd be better if they perhaps picked a different exercise that. Um, focused on the other function of the same muscle group. Um, does that mean that you're not an advocate for things like drop sets and rest pause sets in training? Oh, I am. I am. I love the, those kinds of techniques. And uh, drop sets and uh, rest pause are actually two of my favorites because I think they, uh, you know, I like, I like training intensely. And um, I think you, those techniques can use, can be used to your advantage for example, um, there are some exercises on which it's very hard to really go to failure. Let's so, say you are doing squats and you're training alone. Then you shouldn't go to failure, obviously, because you might not be able to come up. So what you could do is do a certain number of reps, have a short break, and continue, rest, pause, style. I think that's a great way. Or people who let's say train at home and all they can do for the lats is um, um, pull-ups or chin-ups. Um, starting out, most people are not able to do like 10 good chin-ups or something. So um, <clears throat> you should start with um, as many as you can do in, in good form. And then after a very short break, try to do another one. That's a funny story I once heard. I think it was... Chris Dickerson or something, a famous and successful bodybuilder said when he first started out, his, his coach told him to do um, four sets of 10 chin-ups. And then um, the bodybuilder said, but I can only do one chin-up. And then the coach said, well, I guess that means you have to do 40 sets. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that's not what I would recommend, but um, <laughs> it shows the principle. If you, if let's say, you are aiming for a time under tension of 90 seconds or something, and you can only do four or five chin-ups in good slow form, then rest pause is absolutely perfect to, to get your, your time under tension, tension together. Yeah. So, um, and I think it might, the thing is, talking about all these things, drop sets, um, rest pause training, or uh, supersets, um, um, post-exhaustion, pre-exhaustion, all those are fine techniques. But I think the bottom line is, if you really go to failure, you do, do not need additional uh, ways to, to further increase the fatigue of the muscle. Maybe if you're really experienced and advanced, then you might, but most people might not, will not. But the thing is, there are so many exercises or situations or functions of a muscle where you cannot go to failure for, for whatever reason. And then these techniques come in very handy. Um, and that's, by the way, why pre-exhaustion and post-exhaustion was invented, because uh, people realized that that triceps or biceps were not strong enough to, to finish an exercise or finish a set when training the lats or the, the chest muscles. And so they, they used additional techniques. So I think those techniques are really great if you, if you know how to, to use them. And if, as I said before, if you really have gone to failure on your set, there's no need for them maybe. 
And yeah, I mean, this is an interesting uh, point of discussion because I'm, I'm at a point in my training currently in my current program where I have a seated row and overhead press. And I'm, I'm, I mean, we can go into this a little bit more detail uh, later in terms of frequency, but I'm at that challenging point where I've basically plateaued in terms of my performance over the last hmm, month or so on uh, the seated row and the chest, uh, sorry, the overhead press. And I do like an AB routine. It's kind of like a, kind of similar to a two-way split from say Body by Science, um, which I do once a week at the moment. And, um, you know, I've started throwing in a drop set um, after each one of those exercises, you know, drop the weight by the, the smallest increment I can um, and, uh, and maybe wait 20, 30 seconds. I don't, I don't tend to track the, drop, the, the second set in terms of performance because I'm only really looking at improving on the first set, mm-hmm. but if that makes sense. But I will always have, but I'll have a drop set there to see if I can uh, improve my ability to get past that mechanical sticking point in the first set in the next workout if that makes sense. Um, and I, it's, I'm not, I can't, I mean, maybe it's early days and there's other variables, which I've, I've realized lately I've not been accounting for, including things like calorie intake. Um, my <laughs> people won't be too, listeners won't be too surprised. This, but my calorie intake is so low. Um, that if, if I ever expected to gain any more muscle beyond what I've got, um, I'd be, uh, fooling myself because I think that's actually been one of my, um, things holding me back is, is not having adequate nutrition because I've kind of adopted the whole high protein um, intake and that can really keep you satisfied and uh, keep your calorie intake relatively low. Um, so anyway, sorry, I've, I've digressed a bit there. But no, just, no, that's an interesting point. Um, mm. Does it mean you, 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 strict, you, you re- restrict your calories on purpose or is it just something no. that happens because of the way you eat? Right. So no, not at all. I don't restrict at all. I'm not, I wasn't even deliberately counting calories for a very long time. I would eat because um, I got kind of pulled into the uh, whole carnivore diet movement. Um, big fan of what you know, Dr. Ted Naiman talks about. And I was just primarily focusing on animal protein and supplementing it with vegetables. But yeah, meat, fish, and eggs, that kind of thing. Relatively low carb. Um, and I would eat like that and eat this kind of nutrient-dense diet and let that um, automatically, you know, let that kind of satiety come organically. And I never counted my calories. I would track protein. So I'd make sure I got, you know, I'm 155 a poundage in terms of weight and I was trying to get like 165 a day and I actually did see again there could be measurement error I was using calipers and what have you but I did see a very tiny tiny incremental improvement in lean mass but um yeah I'm not sure how how uh, real that is um but then recently I realized wow if I don't track calories my intake is actually more like varies between 1700 and 2000 and which you could argue, you know, it's 500 less than my maintenance calories. Um, so therefore, <laughs> I should probably be eating a little bit more. Is what, um, you know, I had some email correspondence with Skylar Tanner recently. He said, yeah, you probably should. Um, so now I'm experimenting with over well, 2.5 to 3K a day to see if that makes any appreciable change. Um, but with a view to scale it down, should I see a, a, a gain in body fat? Because I don't really want to get fatter. You know what I mean? <laughs> Um, yeah. so that's a long way of saying our drop set's going to serve me where, where I'm at right now. So I'm not sure if that's even a question that you can answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean, because, um, if you have a negative energy balance, then of course it's, it's harder to, to come up with an, with the training intensity that you, that you might need. So that's, that's really a problem. Um, Although I do think that it's a great way of training if you do it fasted. Um, I do not believe, like some people say, I need to eat before I train, otherwise I don't have energy. I mean, it takes some getting uh, accustomed to, but training in a fasted state, I think, is what our body is uh, supposed to be doing. Interesting. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I was recently re-listening to an interview I did with Dr. James Steele. And uh, he obviously you've collaborated with numerous times and um, he does fasted training and he was saying that there's literature to show improvements in, is it mitochondrial density Mm -hmm. uh, as well as VO2 max improvements based on fasted training? Um, Do you think it has any improvement, there's a a benefit to hypertrophy? Mm, I guess so. 
I guess so. I cannot prove it, but uh, the, the points that uh, James mentioned, I think they are very important. Uh, and it shows that your body improves. I mean, the, the, the things you mentioned are, are very important in terms of improve, improving my, my health and improving my, my physical condition. And this should also help you for your hyper, hypertrophy training. Mm. Yeah, and I'm sorry to just, I just kind of like ranted at you then about my, my current situation, but I wanted to give you some context as to where some of these questions might be coming from. Um, and I know that perhaps some of this stuff, maybe the calorie surplus stuff is maybe outside of your professional remit. So, you know. Um, not really. Because okay. That's something I, I would like to, to say something about because I've, I've heard this so many times. In order to gain muscle, you must have a positive energy balance. You must be in positive energy balance. You must eat more than you burn. But that's wrong. I mean, it's easier. It's There's no doubt about it. If you want to gain muscle, it's it's much easier if you eat more energy than you, than you burn. But in order to build muscle, what you need is a positive balance in terms of uh, protein, which means your, your whole, the sum of, your daily protein synthesis must be must be bigger, greater than total protein breakdown. And as long as this as this is working, you gain muscle. I've seen it so many times with my students um, who do a high intensity training program, or with all the other subjects that we did. What we saw is that after let's say three or six months of high intensity training. Um, body mass, body weight, didn't change much. But what we saw is in, in most subjects who gained muscle lost approximately the same amount of body fat. So it's absolutely possible to gain muscle and lose body fat at the same time. And my students, as I said, who train uh, one semester high-intensity training, um, We've, we've seen that over a hundred times. People gain muscle and lose fat at the same time. And it makes perfect sense because um, your body has so much energy to draw from. Even if you are like 10% body fat, very, very lean, then you still have several thousand calories in terms of fat stored in your body because these 10% represent a huge amount of, of energy. So it's no problem to train fasted because you still have energy in your body. You still have glycogen. You still have blood glucose. You still have fat cells, uh, uh, fatty acids stored in your body. And it's the same with gaining. If you, as long as you eat enough protein, train well, rest well, then your muscles will grow. And if that means that your, your body has to draw some of the energy from uh, fat, from its fat stores. Why not? That's absolutely easy for, for the body to do because we've been doing this for thousands of years. And, um, and it's, it's striking to me that, that people do not believe that you can gain muscle and at the same time lose fat because everybody knows that the opposite is possible. If you, let's say you stop working out or you're in a hospital or something, what happens? You lose muscle and gain fat at the same time. So that works very well and everybody knows that. So why is it so hard to believe that it's also possible uh, to have the, the opposite situation, gaining muscle and losing fat at the same time. I mean, I've seen it. I've seen it so many times that I'm absolutely sure that there's no doubt about it. Yeah, and I, and no, I completely agree with you. And um, you know, I've 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 experienced that as well. And I, but in the, in the context of optimization, so you know, if you consider me a, an intermediate or advanced trainee, someone who's been training for five plus years. Um, you know, it, it would seem like it's if, for, if in the quest of um, increasing muscular hypertrophy, optimizing that, that one would need adequate nutrition or maybe a small surplus in order to, in order to stimulate that adaptation. That training in and of itself is not enough um, and a calorie deficit is certainly not going to help. 
Yeah, um, but, but but obviously, you know, I've gained muscle mass, and I've you know, I, I I've been in what looks like a calorie deficit for a very very long period of time, not unknowingly, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and yet I've I've retained muscle, and and the training stimulus has certainly done that. So that's clear. But in terms of actually now moving the needle upwards and it, to where my genetics will allow me to go, it seems like nutrition is perhaps the one variable that I've not been addressing properly in in my own personal journey. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think it's much, much easier to gain muscle mass if you are in a calorie surplus because uh, the whole building process is, is much easier. But that's looking at the problem only short term. Of course, you can gain, let's say, two kilograms of muscle and gain uh, whatever you, five kilograms of, of fat at the same time. So in the short, when you're looking at it short time, You've gained two kilograms of muscle, but the thing is you have to get rid of that fat. And so you need an energy uh, deficit again. And the question is, how much muscle do you lose, use then? So, of course, it's best to only have an energy surplus that is enough to gain muscle, but not enough to gain uh, considerable amounts of fat. But that's difficult. But that's the smartest thing to do, you know, have a have a small surplus that enables you to gain muscle relatively easily but not so much energy that you end up getting fat and what is your what, what advice do you have is the best way for a trainee to do that is it just like i said like start mm-hmm. up start maybe 100 200 over maintenance and and then and then uh scale up and down accordingly based on response is that a good approach uh it is but i think it's um a smart way to do is to do it is, um, I mean, you do not know exactly how many calories you burn a day. You can say roughly so and so many. Okay, so it's there's still even if you are very precise about everything, there's still some guesswork. Um, so what I think you could do is increase your calories, but make most of these calories that end up as your surplus um, be are coming from protein because let's say you eat way too much protein. Um, then some of that might end up being stored as fat, but the body is very inefficient in turning uh, protein into fat. But if you eat uh, high fat or high carbohydrate, that's much easier for the body to, to turn that into fat. I mean, fat is already fat. It can be, I mean, I think 97% of the fat that you eat can be stored as, as fat in your fat cells. But in order to, to um, make fat from protein, your body has to go through certain stages that all are energy costly, which means a lot of protein is burned or is wasted or whatever you want to call it before it end up, uh, ends up being stored as body fat. So for those people who are trying to, to as, you, as bodybuilders say, bulk up, then they should really concentrate on the protein uh, instead of uh, eating too much carbs or too, uh, or too much fat. That's such good advice um, and makes wonderful sense scientifically because, um, like you say, protein is, is difficult to store it as fat. Um, and I guess the only concern there is all the debates at the moment regarding um, – protein intake and mTOR uh, stimulation and, and, and which can lead to, well, some people believe it can lead to causing cancer. Um, but, but, you know, I know that some people believe that's, you know, nonsense in the context of a healthy individual who's doing strength training and things like that. Um, but yeah, I see the logic in, in, in the context of gaining muscle uh, in that if you're trying to, you want a calorie surplus, then protein is the best way to do that without gaining fat or, or reducing the possibility of gaining fat. Um, <laughs> the only downside to it is it's hard, right? Because protein is so satiating. Um, just yesterday, I, I cooked this, uh, you know, probably about um, just over a pound of roast beef. And I was trying to just eat this. Bit. This is my sole meal is just this uh, pound of beef. And I was trying to eat it and I ate half and I was like, I can't have any more of this. I'm absolutely stuffed. So I, I, I don't force myself. So at 2,500 for the day, I, I stopped eating. I was like, no, because I look at it more of an average. You know, again, 
this is advice offered by James Steele to me, it was, he was saying, don't stress about the daily, look at the average over time in terms of your intake for protein and overall calories, and then use that as your guide. Uh, I, I feel for me that is way more um, sustainable uh, way of doing it. Is that, do you agree with that? Is that uh, absolutely, I agree with that. And there's something more I have to say, because um, you are absolutely right that eating tons of protein is maybe not the best thing you can do health-wise. Right. But we were talking about gaining lean muscle, and that's a different uh, sure. Uh, sure story. Um, so I think it's also <clears throat> important to, um, if you do, let's say, if you aim for a surplus of energy or protein and anything, then it should be on the days of your training or following your training. Okay. So, you know, some of the bodybuilders, they, they will even stuff themselves on, on non-training days, which I think doesn't make so much sense. Um, the most important meal, obviously, is uh, post-workout. And so this is what somebody who's trying to gain should aim for, that uh, he or she should uh, ingest most of the energy post-workout because that's when it's most likely to be, um, you know, turned into muscle. Yeah. And by the way, just for the listeners, you can't, you won't be able to see Jürgen, but um, just so you know, Jürgen looks fantastic. And I can see that you keep yourself in very, very good shape, which is uh, partly the reason I'm so inspired to ask you all these questions. I mean, obviously, you know your stuff, you're a scientist, but um, you also walk the walk, which, uh, which is um, pretty important, I think. Um, Jürgen, that's, that, thank you for that. That was very helpful for me personally. Uh, and I'll surely be, be re-listening to this to, uh, to help, um, help take what you say and form my own, my own program, my own diet and training. Um, I just wanted to ask you some more, I guess, questions around the subject of frequency. And this is something which, you know, I, I'm sure you've heard about me talk about this with other guests on the show. It comes up all the time. Um, you know, some listeners will be saying, or thinking, come on, Lawrence, like, you know, are we really talking about frequency again? Because I, it's something that I, 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 I maybe, maybe the science hasn't asked all the questions yet. Um, and personally, I still, I struggle to wrap my head around what's optimal and how to figure out, because obviously there's an enormous amount of variability in individuals when it comes to frequency. And from what I understand, there's a bell curve and there are some people that get away with very high frequency and others that actually need, you know, maybe weeks of training in order to see results. Um, you know, I, I actually have really struggled throughout my training career to, un, to identify the optimal frequency for me. Um, you know, I've trained, I mean, I, I, I've trained multiple times per week, you know, two to three times per week, felt absolutely fine. Haven't felt like I've been run over by a truck, as Doug would say. Um, but I haven't probably seen appreciable improvements in performance. Um, and then similarly, I've trained you know, once a week or once every two weeks and also seen plateaus in performance. So sometimes it's really hard to identify whether performance is being kept stagnant because of sticking points versus genetics or, or strength limitations, I don't know, or, or lack of recovery. So, you know, for instance, um, I'm really drawing out this question now, but uh, I recently reread Body by Science and, you know, <clears throat> maybe I misinterpreted this and Doug will probably correct me, but they seem to be quite um, adamant in that book that once a week is really optimal for most of the population. But most of the high-intensity training community advocate twice a week. So I really value your, you helping me reconcile this because I, I struggle with it personally. Mm -hmm. Well, I think or from my experience, um, I can say, and I've seen it with many uh, subjects that we trained, that you can absolutely make good progress in terms of strength increases and the mus muscular hypertrophy if you train once a week. Um, but I would also suggest training twice a week, for several, at least twice a week, for several reasons. Because um, what we also see from looking at the, the literature is that for most people, working a muscle or, I mean, we're talking about the whole body program here, if you try to say once a week. Uh, working a muscle twice a week usually um, leads to better gains in both strength and muscle mass than training only once a week. Um, having said that, um, problem is the, how long does the muscle take to recover and so on. 
we've got these uh, rule of thumbs, uh, rules of thumb, like saying that uh, after 48 to 72 hours, usually a muscle has recovered and can be trained again. And um, this works very well for most people. But as you said, as always, distribution, some people are at the higher end, at the lower end of recovery ability. And um, I think the ability to recover is the one factor that differs most in the whole training game. I give you an example. Um, several years ago, I talked to a colleague who wanted to do a study um, and he wanted to do he wanted to study the effects of overtraining. And so he was looking for subjects, sports students, um, who he wanted to get into a state of overtraining by having them do a, a high intensity and high volume workout, full body workout every day for several weeks. And the problem was that after half a week, the first subject said, we cannot go on. I can, there's no way I can train today. I'm so, I feel terrible. And there were others in the same group who did the same kind of exercise who still gained strength on the sixth day. That means they trained from Monday to Saturday, full body workouts, very intense, high volume, and some of them still got stronger. They increased their weights. And other people in the same group said, after three days, said, there's no way I can continue. So they dropped the study. They couldn't even finish the study. And, um, yeah. And this really uh, taught me a lesson. And um, mm -hmm. I think training frequency, coming back to your, to your question, uh, which is better training once a week, twice a week, three times a week. I think, first of all, it depends very much on if you do a whole body exercise, I mean, a whole body routine, or if you do a split routine. Um, but it's also possible for many people to work out three times a week doing a full body routine. Personally, I would, for, for those who said I want to take, drain my whole body in one session, I would recommend training twice a week. That works for most people very well. Mm -hmm. Dr. McGuff is absolutely right that training once a week is enough to make good progress. But one thing that um, I think is problematic about training only once a week is we know that I mean, training is not only good for stimulating increases in strength and muscle, but it offers so many benefits yeah. health-wise that, it, I mean, it's like medicine. And it's, it's a good thing to get this medicine not only once a week, but uh, several times. I mean, when you talk about myokines and all that uh, things, you know, we don't have to go into detail here, but everybody knows that a training session, and you feel it after having trained intensely, you feel great. Yeah. Uh, and this shows us that um, training is something that we should, uh, well, we should indulge in more often than only once a week to get the benefits from it. I mean, you burn fat, you burn glycogen, and um, you stimulate hormones, anabolic hormones. You, um, you stimulate your, your, your myokines and everything. And that in itself is so beneficial that I think we should uh, aim for training uh, more than once a week. And something else, training is also fun. I mean, if you have somebody who really loves to train and tell him train only once for 30 minutes a week, that's something that will not satisfy most people. You know? yeah. And um, myself, I, I would like to do a whole full body workout three times a week, but... That's not enough training. <laughs> I like to split up my training going upper body, lower body, so I can train up to four times a week. That's how often you train yourself? Um, at the moment, yes. It depends. Sometimes if I'm very busy, I train only twice a week, full body. Um, it, it really depends on how much time I have. But if I have time, I try to train four times a week. Oh, wow. Okay. This episode is brought to you by our sponsor, ARX. Are you looking to create a cutting edge, high intensity training facility? Are you confused on what equipment to use or how to separate yourself from the masses? Well, then ARX Fit might be the answer you're looking for. I asked Mike Palano from ARX a few questions about how ARX machines are challenging the status quo of the exercise industry around the globe. 
Mike, if you could, give the listeners a quick summary of why ARX is so different from the traditional machines or tools they're used to seeing in most exercise facilities. ARX is totally different than anything you've seen before. This isn't just another weight stack machine. We've looked at the last 40 years of exercise technology and used that knowledge to create something entirely new. ARX uses a new form of resistance, a motor, and we pair that motor with computer software so that we can maximize the safety, effectiveness, and efficiency of your workouts. So you may be asking, okay, but how does ARX compare to weights? Traditional machines you see in gyms today are based on lifting metal weights and battling gravity. What people don't realize is that when you're forced to lift a static weight like this, one that doesn't adapt or change while you use it, you're underloading yourself rep after rep. And this unnecessarily limits your ability to make improvements. With ARX, we've taken a totally different approach. We removed weights and gravity from the equation altogether. Instead, ARX combines our patented motorized resistance with our custom computer software to provide you with the world's safest, most effective, and most quantified form of resistance training ever. When you train with ARX, you are training to your perfect level of resistance both positively and negatively, 100% of the time. No more guessing what weight to use, ARX does all of that for you, instantly and automatically. We'll also track and measure every second of every rep, so you can quantify all of your workouts to find out if you're improving and by exactly how much. Whether your goals are bigger muscles, increased strength, stronger bones, or just to look good in a bathing suit, ARX can help you achieve all of these and more, but do so in a fraction of the time it would take compared to traditional equipment. If you're looking for the most efficient, most effective, and most quantified piece of exercise equipment on the market today, then look no further than ARX. Thanks, Mike. That all sounds really impressive. If you'd like to learn more about ARX, visit arxfit.com and mention that you heard about ARX on the Corporate Warrior podcast to receive an exclusive deal of $500 off shipping and installation off your ARX machines. Um, yeah, that's really interesting because, okay, so, because this is the thing, I feel like I can trade more frequently. I don't feel, I mean, I'm, I have pretty good control over the stresses in my life. Um, so I feel like I could train more consistently, but then... If you're, if you're, now I know there are people that don't count anymore because they don't really think there's much value in counting. Where others will say, no, you have to track because if your numbers aren't improving, um, then, or you resist in terms of your reps or time under load or, or, or load, um, then actually your body needs more recovery than you think. Um, so, do you think that's important? And, you know, in my case, where I'm seeing, I mean, I know you would probably have to see my charts more accurately and, and understand all of my lifestyle factors, but my numbers are pretty flat. Well, they're not pretty flat. There is probably slight improvement, but it's really difficult. I, I can't be alone in this. I imagine there's a lot of people who do this training that really splitting hairs over this stuff and they're worried that they're overtraining or overreaching um, and they think that's blocking progress. So, Really bad question again, but can you speak on that? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, generally speaking, it's a good idea to track your your weights and uh, everything. But um, again, you have to be able to compare it to something that is really comparable. Because, I mean, someday you might um, do your chest press two minutes after having done a leg press. And the next workout, it's three minutes. And that makes a huge difference, for example. Um, Sometimes you've slept five hours a night and another day you slept eight hours the night before a workout. So if, if you track things, then you have to track everything in order to find out what is the reason that made a difference. You, you cannot just look at your training charts. And that's I mean, some people, they write down everything, so and so many reps of that exercise with that weight. And years after that, they look at it. And it, 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 it is some helpful information, but in order to really get most out of it, you should also write down how much you ate that day and uh, how long you slept and everything. Uh, even the, the kind of emotional state you were in, I think, does play a role. 
And so, yeah, tracking is a good thing, but um, it, it can only give you hints. To take him a pinch and, of salt kind of thing. Yeah. And you're absolutely right about um, that we should always be conscious not to overtrain because, let's face it, overtraining is much worse than undertraining because undertraining means that you are not making all the progress you could make, but you're still making progress or at least you are staying the same. But overtraining is... Is the opposite. It's negative. It means you're losing. You're losing muscle. You're losing strength. So um, we have to be very careful. And uh, that's what I try to do. If I do not feel recovered, then I don't train. I might take a walk or something, but I won't work out if I don't uh, feel I have uh, recovered sufficiently. And that's what I also recommend. You should not, uh, I mean, if, if your diary says you have to train today, you have to do uh, whatever decent this kind of workout because it's due today but if you really don't feel like it and not just being lazy or something if you're still sore if you really f feel bad um, then you shouldn't do it you should rest another day resting one day too many is much better than resting one day too short or not enough love that and completely agree so okay so really you can like you say it's so you know to expect us to be able to track our performance accurately is so it's almost impossible, right? Based on what you just said. Um, so really, going on feel is probably the best thing. And, Absolutely, and, and and not worrying. Cause maybe I'm being too neurotic. I am, aren't I? <laughs> I'm worrying <laughs> I too much because so. I guess I'm one. Of, I'm, I I think sometimes I am worried about being the outlier, about being the guy that actually <laughs> that needs two weeks to recover and then he turns into Mr. Olympian. <laughs> but, yeah, no, mean, that's, you, that's nonsense, obviously. No, but you might be. I mean, it's absolutely... If, if you feel that you need a lot of time to recover, then I think you're absolutely right. And this is not just... I mean, feeling... When you talk about feeling, this sounds so unscientific, but there were actually studies on that. What they did is they, they asked um, experts in many areas... Um, about their gut feeling. And I can't, can't go into detail here, but uh, what you saw is people uh, who are very experienced in a certain area, a certain aspect, they can tell you some things that others don't see. And it's the same. You are the greatest expert concerning your body. And if you don't feel like exercising, then your doctor or your, your coach or whoever um, does not have superior information or, I mean, you, if you feel, um, if you feel like training, then there's a reason for that. And if, if you don't feel like training, and I'm not talking, talking about just being tired or lazy or anything, if you say, oh, I don't think I can work out today because I don't feel reco recovered enough, then I think you've got a point there. And you can trust your own feeling because you know yourself so well. And you've been training now for, for several years. I mean, for a beginner, that's a totally different story. You, know? you have to get experience and you have to be able to tell not feeling well from, from not being motivated or the, those kind of things. But after years of training, you know how to do that. And that's what I would encourage people. You know? It's the same with high-intensity training. I'm really a proponent of high-intensity training, but sometimes the students come up and say, well, what can you recommend? What kind of training can you recommend? I, you know, I'm the type of guy, I really must go to the gym every day and uh, I have to, to work out every day and uh, do my shoulders, my chest, my everything. I would never recommend a high intensity training program to such a kind of person because obviously they have a different agenda going on. They, they, they just love being in the gym and love to do stuff. And so they should do a volume approach because that's what they obviously want to do but you know for people I've, I've been asking many people say well i really would like to work out but i don't know i don't have the time or things and that's where high intensity training is perfect mm, i think we we could get so many people into working out if they really understood how little time it takes I mean, who cannot spare 
45 minutes twice a week. I mean, most people can do that. It's difficult for young moms who have to raise uh, two children and uh, who cannot. I mean, if the, ch the child is sick, you cannot go to the workout. And, and obviously, the, some people really don't cannot make the time, but most people can. And um, that's something that is important to me to tell people, listen, there's so much benefit to be gained from, from working out. Um, and the amount of time you have to invest is so little. Just try it. Try it once a week, half an hour. Just get into it. And um, I think we, we could solve a lot of health problems if people... Um, Yeah, worked out more. <laughs> no, absolutely. Uh, I, I, yeah, t time is when people understand this. Time no longer is really an excuse. Um, you know, even if you can only train once a week or less, um, you know, all you need is ten or fifteen minutes, and you can really deliver a profound stimulus to the entire body for you know general health. And I know we focus primarily on the aesthetics at the first half of this and that's my fault um but uh but obviously as 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 you know all too well and as many listeners will know this is really the um the the the, the highest return when it comes to exercise and overall health um and, and i completely agree and i really appreciate your thoughts on um you know where i'm at uh, i find that very very helpful and i know there are tons of people listening who are just like me similar boat trying to find out what works best for them and i think this is going to be quite helpful for them as well um just i've got um, a few more questions for you again before we go into some of your research uh, i'm really curious to know when it comes to high intensity training i mean i'm sure you've had a number of, a large amount of you know correspondence with people in this in this kind of camp and i'm just curious to know where you depart from the typical print the kind of mindset within high intensity training is there certain things that you don't buy into or don't agree with maybe maybe prolonged recovery is one of those things i don't know well not necessarily because as i said it really depends on what your goals are what what you're trying to accomplish and what kind of person you are so even training once a week, which I personally would not recommend to most people, makes perfect sense for some. So um, I agree very, very much with uh, James Fisher, who on your podcast said that um, the high intensity community should not, uh, you know, argue over splitting hairs or something. Right? Um, if you look at what Arthur Jones, who I think was a genius, um, Uh, how he defined high-intensity high training. I think this is what most people can agree upon, like uh, doing one working set per exercise, um, preferably training your body, um, your whole body in one session, uh, working out only infrequently, whatever that means. That can be two, exercise, uh, two, two workouts per week for one person, three for another person. But when we look at these basic definitions, like I give you an example, um, there's some controversy over uh, super slow, slow or no, no super, super slow training. I think high intensity training has to be slow. You have to use absolutely proper form, perfect form, and do it slow. And slow means training slow enough to avoid momentum. Um, that's the whole point. And if that means uh, that one repetition lasts seven seconds, that's okay. And if it's 10, 12, 14, whatever seconds, that's okay too. I mean, as long as it does not become static or, you know, as long as you're still moving the weight, then that's fine with me. Uh, no matter if the, if the repetition uh, lasts 10 seconds or, or six or seven. And it's also different for, for, If you do a pullover, for example, that takes much longer than just a biceps curl. So that's one example. And if we agree on the basic definition on high intensity training, I have, I think that we can all agree on, on that. And for some people, it may mean doing a split routine. Like for bodybuilders, they usually do split routines. For, for another person, it could mean uh, working out once a week or three times a week. It's all high-intensity training. I wouldn't say that that's, uh, that's, that's one kind of training that it isn't. Yeah. So, okay. So, agree with, uh, I guess, the, the, the classic principles for the most part. Um, 
let's talk about uh, your training and diet for a moment. Um, you know, as I, as I was saying earlier, you know, clearly you look after yourself. You train four times a week with uh, currently with a split routine. Is that kind of like upper body, lower body, upper body, lower body, like that? Is it or? Yeah, it is. And I okay. wouldn't. Necess- I mean, it's a split routine, but I. Um, um, the thing is, it's very hard to train your whole body in one workout. And um, what I found for myself, I cannot speak for everybody, but what I found for myself is the last one or two exercises usually suffers in terms of intensity of effort. So um, I, for, for me, it works very well to, to split it up, like training my whole upper body one uh, training session and the, the lower body the next training session. And, um, well... That's how I usually train. And I always make sure to train in a fast state. That means um, I usually, I try to not eat for 16 hours or something. And uh, my workout is usually at the end of that period. And um, so that means that if I can, if I have the time, I try to work out around noon some days where I'm really busy and I know I have so many uh, appointments and stuff to do during the day, then I will get up at four and work out at five in the morning. That's no problem too, because um, I'm not the type of person who can uh, go to the gym after a day, a very hard day at work and work out at, at say, uh, eight o'clock in the evening or something after, you know, working 12 hours. I, that's not something I can... <laughs> do so i prefer training very early in the morning if i have to um i think training in a faster state and training intensely and training almost your whole body in one session that has another benefit because i do not i mean i'm not i do not worry about carbohydrates i try not to overdo it and i try to avoid sugar as much as possible. I mean, completely, actually. And um, but after workout, I enjoy having a bowl of uh, fruit, oatmeal, cottage cheese with berries, a fruit, and apple. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. I have absolutely no problem with that. <laughs> um, the only thing is, I tell my PhD students not to to eat apples because an apple a day keeps the doctor away. But that's a, a bad joke. Um, <laughs> um, So basically, I fast, then I work out, and then I have my, if you will, high uh, high protein and high carb meal. And the rest of the day, I try to eat in a moderate carb and everything moderate. (laughs) Because, I mean, I look like an ectomorph, but there were times when I was quite uh, chubby, overweight as a a young lad. that happened when I was had an injury and I couldn't do sports and I gained weight and I didn't like that very much. So I think, you know, when you're young, everybody trains for, for muscle mass and for becoming the next Arnold or whatever. But when you're not so young anymore, I think this changes. And uh, so I have my emphasis concerning my training is on health, health expert. So, um, I think a very, very important principle is, uh, like in Latin, they said what they learn in medicine in the first first day of their of, of studying to become a, a doctor, you learn primo non nocere. First of all, do no harm. And that's very important because if you go to a gym as a, as a starting, uh, let's say you want to start working out, have no idea what to do, you go to a gym, ask the coach, and he will tell you, well, you have to do bench press, you have to do press behind the neck and everything. But some of these exercises might not benefit you, and some might even destroy your shoulders if you don't do them correctly. So I think the most important rule that everybody should watch out for, I mean, everybody, even when you're young and don't notice the immediate effects of what you're doing, first of all, concentrate on not doing any harm. And then the second, uh, I mean, it takes some, it takes some finding out. Um, for example, an exercise that I really love but cannot do is the deadlift. Um, if I have, if I do a deadlift, I have to really uh, use light weight because I have some problems 
uh, in my spine because I'm I'm very tall and I grew too fast. A uh, physiotherapist told me that a few years ago. He said, "You've got the condition in your in your spine that you shouldn't, uh, you know, bend over with using so much weight and so on." So I have to be careful about that, which I didn't know, but I, I felt it after every time after that lift, I felt a pain in my back. And I shouldn't have, should have listened to my body uh, earlier. But now that I know that, I, I work around that. And I think that's a very important point. Even if an exercise is great for 98% of the people, it doesn't necessarily mean that it fits your kind of training, your body structure or whatever. So you have to be honest to yourself. No? If you if you notice that, like, the press behind the neck is a good example. Some people get away with that, not hurting their shoulders, but... I've seen people who absolutely crush their shoulders doing that exercise. I don't didn't think anyone could get away with that over a long enough period of time because of the impingement yeah. of the shoulder. So, exactly. So surely everyone pays the price eventually, no? Exactly. <laughs> and so, so what you uh, so what you can do about it is try to stay on top of the information. If if you read something that an exercise might cause impingement, as you said, or something, then you should be careful. And if you if your own body tells you not to do a certain exercise, then you should listen as well. Um, and But there's so many exercises you can do to pick from. So that's absolutely no problem. If you cannot do one exercise, there's plenty of others that you can do. So that's no excuse. I mean, some people say, I cannot work out because I have that thing in my I don't know, toe or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and I say, well, you can. That's always a one. It's always a way to, to work around something. And your book's got some great routines, actually. So I do encourage listeners to to definitely purchase a copy of Jürgen's book, High Intensity Training, um, because there's plenty of great routines at the back to choose from and customize your own. And just out of interest, how tall are you, Jürgen? Um, one meter, 93 centimeters. I think that's six, three or six, four or something. Oh, I don't know. Right, okay. Yeah, I was going to say that means nothing to me. You have to translate into feet and inches. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So really interested to, to learn more about your research. Um, particularly because from what I understand, it's been done in high intensity training, which is, you know, you hear a lot of research done in terms of the out, you know, the outcomes and adaptations caused by resistance training. But to actually look at high intensity training specifically is, um, is very interesting. Um, so the first study you mentioned, and neither of these are published yet, is my understanding from what you said. Um, and it's funny because actually I was looking for these, these research papers online and for ages. And then I read this last line of your email, which said, oh, by the way, Lawrence, these aren't published yet. So you won't find them. No, I'm sorry. Um, no, 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 no. It's not your fault. I should have read the whole email. Um, but anyway, the first one is with regard to to the subject suffering from type 2 diabetes. Tell me about that study and what you found. Yeah, that was the kind of study that I did with together with a PhD student uh, some years ago. And um, we studied the effects on high-intensity training on type 2 diabetes patients. And the thing was, the, the idea was that strength training, resistance training, especially high-intensity tr training, should be perfect for people who've got problems with their sugar metabolism because, um, you know, that high-intensity training uh, needs... I mean, no, let's put it this way. Um, a problem, a vicious circle for diabetes patients is because of their diabetes, they cannot... Uh, they think they cannot work out. They cannot... They have to, you know, be careful about everything they do physically. So they lose muscle because they do not exercise. But losing muscle means that they have um, lost glycogen stores. And now if you, if you break this, if you cut through this vicious circle and increase the amount of muscle that somebody has, this person has more way, way to store or more, more storage capacity for, for glycogen. And that was the idea behind that. And um, to my knowledge, not many people, if at all, have done studies with um, high-intensity training for diabetes type 2 patients because the word high-intensity scares everybody away. It scares the patients, the doctors, and everything. Um, we did this study under medical supervision. There was a doctor who uh, supervised the, the, <clears throat> the patients all the time. How did the doctor and feel about the protocol? 
Oh, he liked it. He yeah. liked it. He, he was enthusiastic about it. And uh, he took all the measurements, you know, the blood sugar and everything. And the interesting part is uh, the average, there were 29 uh, people when we started and uh, 28 in the control group. And um, we had, first of all, six months of uh, just, you know, studying the, the, the physical condition, but not training. We studied the control group for six months and the, the which would later be the, the training group for six months. Then after six months, the training started. Two full body workouts a week, 10 exercises, um, 45 minutes, each set taken to failure. Um, and the results were fantastic. I mean, um, people in the thing is in the control group, uh, people got worse. That was a sad part, you know. Those who did not train, um, they had um, first of all, the people in the in the training group, they gained muscle and lost fat, and they improved their diabetic condition very much. Um, I've got the numbers somewhere. I think uh, I think forty one percent. Improve uh, did not meet. Um, anyway, what, what I can tell you is that several <laughs> several people in the training group did not need any insulin anymore after six months of training, and um, I think almost fifty percent could reduce their medication. Well, you said seventy five percent of them were able to reduce their diabetes medication after six. Okay, months. that's exactly that's, that's amazing. That's, yeah. Yeah. That's that's something we would never have expected. And another interesting thing was that about half of the subjects in the study, after the one year the study was, was finished, and several of them, about half of them, continued training on their own. They, they were so convinced about uh, what the training did to them that they uh, continued training. And the interesting thing was they improved even more. Um, those who stopped training after the six months, they got worse um, up to a point where they were in the same condition as before. So after 12 months, after finishing the story, uh, the study, um, many of those who did not continue training were basically in the same condition as they were when they started uh, the study. So that's something else you have to continue. It's, I mean, it's called an interve intervention, but it should go on. Did you that should... correlate with a uh, return to muscle mass return to the what it was at the start of the first of the study? Did that correlate with that, or do you remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. approximately it did. Right, that um, makes sense, right? Yeah, but another thing is the subjects after six months. Uh, by the way. Some of them, they doubled their strength. That was another interesting aspect. I mean, strength was something that we didn't look for in the, in the first place. So that was a, a byproduct, if you will. Um, but they, they felt so much stronger and so much more energetic. Um, you know, we had all kinds of tests and asked them how they felt and everything. And some people said, well, I, I had stopped working in my garden because I couldn't tolerate the stress anymore. And now I can... I can again. I feel. I, some, somebody said I feel like being born again. So the effect on them was very, very dramatic. And um, something that I would like to stress is there's absolutely no reason to be afraid of high intensity training because high intensity, as I said before, this scares away a lot of people. But what it effectively means is just if you are able to do ten reps with a certain weight, then just do ten reps and not stop after nine or nine and a half or something. So, and we explained that to the, to the subjects, the patients, and said, there's absolutely no reason to be worried or concerned. You can do that. And if you don't feel well, just stop and tell us and so on. But there, were, there was not a single dropout because of, um, there were some dropouts because of other reasons that had nothing to do with the study, but there was not a single dropout um, because of an injury or something. And that's something I would like to add. In all the studies that I have been involved in so far, the more than 
100 students who did a high intensity training, the senior citizens that did a, the diabetics and so on. There was never a single case of injury because it's absolutely impossible if you do it, if you do it right. Because we always tell people the first and most important thing is do the exercise right, do it slowly, don't overdo it and so on. And then take it to failure. And that works perfectly well. And we've had many injuries. I mean, it's, uh, the, my class is on Monday. And very often a student will come up and say, oh, I don't know if I can train today because I injured myself yesterday playing football or something. But there was never an incident where an injury occurred because of high-intensity training. Yeah, no, that's so interesting and um, really cool to see because I know it's one of those things where it's like, well, you know, most people who have been involved in high intensity training and reading about it for a while um, will will go, well, we, we know that. We know that, um, you know, it, uh, resistance training generally will improve insulin sensitivity and will um, deplete glycogen stores and, and in basically reverse the metabolic syndrome, which is obviously a, a precursor to diabetes um, or the same thing, if I'm getting that correct. And so, so that's kind of logical, but actually to see research using this protocol to demonstrate that and showing that is is obviously really really important. Um, sorry, my my dog is running around like crazy. I'm trying to figure out what's wrong with her. Anyway, um, <laughs> so the the other study which you um, which you did or mentioned, which was uh, very interesting, was on um, identical twins. Um, where you did one twin training three times a week, doing three sets of 10, uh, and the other tw twin doing once a week, one set of 10 exercises to failure. Now, again, I, you, you, um, cause these were unpublished, you said like, you know, I, I can't tell you the result. Well, I can't send you a paper to show you the result, but I can tell you about it. So now I'm really on the edge and want to, want to know the outcome of that one. So yeah. can you, can you tell us more? Absolutely. The reason why this is not published yet is very simple because um, you need a certain number of subjects uh, to be able to do calculations in order to see if there's statistical significance. And so far, we've only had um, five sets of uh, twins. So that's only 10 people. Uh, and that's not enough. So we uh, and it's very hard to, to recruit identical twins as subjects because <laughs> there, there are not so many. Um, but the idea was that what we see all the time is that um, exercise tolerance and the, the amount of muscle you can gain is very, it depends on your genetics. Um, and as I said, um, if, I mean, two people go to the gym and one will gain, let's say in the first year, five kilograms of muscle and the other will only gain one kilogram of muscle. That doesn't mean that the person who only gained one kilogram did something wrong. Maybe his potential for muscle growth is only in that you know amount so it's very interesting to look at twins because they are identical um, concerning their genetic um, situation and um, as you said we had one twin uh, train three sets of 10 three times a week and the other twin only train once a week one set to failure and the results are very interesting apart from one uh, couple of twins um, where one twin did not gain any muscle because he simply didn't eat enough. Um, we've seen progress with everybody. That means no matter if they did the volume approach or if they did only one session of high-intensity training per week, they all gained muscle. But we've had some dramatic uh, differences. There was one um, pair of twins where the one who did the volume approach gained 1.5 kilograms of muscle in 10 weeks and his brother only gained 500 grams on the high intensity training program. And then we had another pair of twins where one Quinn, who did the volume approach, gained, I think, 300 grams of muscle in 10 weeks. And his brother, who did the high-intensity training, gained three kilograms of muscle. Ten and that was, that was the most outstanding uh, uh, thing we found so far. Ten, gaining 10 kilograms, uh, sorry, in 10 weeks, gaining three kilograms of muscle 
um, that was really, really outstanding with, with one workout per week. And so, and that's <clears throat> very interesting as I think, because it proves that there's more than one way to work out. I mean, and what was funny was that we, we, uh, the question who does which kind of program you, you throw a coin, basically. That's what you do. Because otherwise you have some kind of bias. If somebody wants, says, I really want to try that. And th this person might be more motivated. So we throw a coin and say, okay, you're doing the high intensity training. You're doing the volume training. Um, and what we found is that some people say, well, I like that kind of training very much. And others say, mm, I didn't like that. I would have preferred to do the other one. And so, as I said before, it's a lot of uh, personal choice and personal difference, you know. And that's why I would not uh, say that everybody must do high-intensity training. Only those who who get it, <laughs> as I say. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> um, well... Those who are smarter, basically. Yeah, that no, sounds incredibly That's arrogant. what you said. You said that. <laughs> I did. I did say that. <laughs> um, no, it's... <laughs> Hey, I got one friend who, uh, you know, he tried doing high intensity training after I suggested it to him. And after, I think he, he read Body by Science and a few other things. Um, and he just went to me, mate, as, uh, how us, us English uh, address each other. He goes, mate, that's just too hard. He said, and he, he's a, a more of a high volume advocate and got, you know, fair play to him, got great results. Um, and he said, look, you know, if I'm strapped for time, high intensity training is the way to go, but otherwise I'm going to do my volume stuff. I'm going to do my multiple sets because it's just, you know, less, it's just easier. It's less, less, uh, challenging for him in his view and, um, all the power to him. You know, if that gets him results, if that gets him in the gym, then that's all that matters. And kind of, I think one of the, a good way to, um, wrap up this this podcast is is just on that point you know the 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 the, the sentence um or the saying that all roads lead to rome um i i think is is really quite true um and love to hear you comment on this year that you know as long as we're training and, and again i'm stealing this from probably james Steele and fisher uh as long as you're training with a high enough degree of effort whether you get there in one set or multiple sets you're kind of getting to the same place um and stimulating all you can um, and going back to what Doug told me years ago is just lift weights. And, you know, there's all this arguing going on about what's the most effective protocol, but maybe when it comes to training effort and getting to failure is really all that really matters. And everything else is kind of window dressing and splitting hairs, you know? Um, so I'm not, uh, and I know there's a lot of debate going on right now about, um, you know, alternative protocols to, um, add more stress to the training to, to stimulate more improvement. But I'm just not sure if that's really that valuable. Um, and I think, you know, all roads perhaps do lead to Rome. And do you, do you agree with that, that idea? Absolutely. I do. Absolutely. Um, and you're right. When, if, let's say for whatever reason, you cannot fatigue your muscle, uh, doing one set, then do another one. If, I mean, if you need that additional set, then go ahead and do it. But it's a better approach to uh, to, to fatigue the, the muscle right away in the first in the first uh, set. Um, but yeah, I absolutely agree with you. Um, the most important thing is that people work out, that they do something, that they are active, and that they that they work out, that they go to the gym or whatever that they have to work out. That's a, but. <clears throat> Looking at the people who do not work out yet, when you talk to them, why do you not work out? And many will say, well, I would like to, but I don't have the time. And that's where high-intensity training really is something that could make people uh, go to the gym. And I think <clears throat> the, the high-intensity training kind of thing has the most growth potential because when you look at the gyms, you have thousands of people uh, following, you know, Arnold's training program and multiple set and split routine and training every day and everything. But that's not for everybody, obviously, right? So what we should do is concentrate on those people who are not yet working out and tell them there's a lot of benefit to be gained. Just get started. Go to the gym once a week. Start out with doing once a week and then 
twice a week and see how it works for you. That's very important. And, you know, something that, that really annoys me is that um, usually, I mean, there's lots of evidence that you can gain muscle and strength doing one set per exercise. We don't, I, I, I mean, it's so obvious we don't have to talk about it even. But what really annoys me is that when people know that you're doing research on high-intensity training, they will always ask, why do you only do one set or why do you only recommend one set? I think this is the wrong question because this is what I call reversing the burden of proof. Because usually if you want to convince somebody that it's necessary to do more, then this person should have convincing arguments. I mean, it has been proven that one set is all you need to gain muscle. But now somebody might say you need three sets. Well, then it's up to them to prove that, don't you think? I mean, if you, like I said before, if you're working a certain amount of, if your kids want three times uh, as much pocket money, then they better have some arguments to convince you. And uh, it's the same way. If somebody wants you to do more, he better have some good convincing arguments. And uh, there's no doubt that you can gain muscle from one set. So maybe if somebody says, well, two or even three sets are much, much better. Okay, show me. If you can convince me, I'm the first person to do three sets. And, uh, you know, I remember, because I've re-listened to these actually quite recently, you know, I interviewed uh, Dr. James Fisher years back and, um, you know, he commented on some of the meta-analysis by, um, I think it was James Krieger, who's also been on the show, um, which tried to show that multiple sets were, were more effective. And, um, you know, obviously James, uh, I'm not sure if he did this himself or with colleagues, I'm not sure if you were involved, Jürgen, but he published the Beware of the Meta-Analysis, which... Mm -hmm. was a kind of rebuttal to that saying, look, multiple sets might be better than single sets, but this doesn't prove that. Um, I'm not sure what's happened since then. I, I'm, I'm not, I mean, I don't stay close enough to the literature to know if anything's been published uh, following that on, on this. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure there's plenty of articles written about that meta-analysis, but I'm not so sure if... Um, there's been any further research on this that's well controlled. So is there anything further on this that I'm not aware of? And clearly you're not convinced. <laughs> <laughs> As you said, I'm not convinced. I mean, there's always the discussion uh, of that higher volume might be more beneficial. And uh, there was a study by uh, Pat Schoenfeld who said that it's, I think he said 10 sets per week. Is that's right. Yeah. Uh, optimum. yeah. And again, I would say, well, maybe, but 10 sets per muscle, this could also be, it doesn't mean 10 sets of bubble curls. I mean, how do you count a chin-up? Do you count that as a biceps exercise as well, or is it just a lat exercise? How do you count that? And that's a problem. I mean, when we're talking about sets and volume, but it hasn't been properly defined by the people who suggest these things. Yeah. Um, and, okay, another thing that I would would like to mention is, Maybe if, let's say there's a result that um, doing multiple sets is 5% better. Then you would ask, would have to ask, for how many people is that kind of information really relevant? Because for all those who work out for health reasons or for, for staying fit or for, you know. But in their, in their defense, I mean, Brad and James and that, they're really focused on bodybuilding and the aesthetic. They're, they're always looking at what's optimal, not what's... Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's that's a good point. Um, so they really are, but, but they're obviously, you know, they're, I mean, you're right. And I forgot about that paper, actually, that you mentioned there about the 10 sets. That's obviously more recent. Um, say more recent, it's probably been out for a while now. Uh, but there, I believe, I mean, I had Brad on the show a couple of times and I believe their contention is still that, you know, more volume than what traditional high intensity training might advocate is more effective for muscle hypertrophy. Um, again, just looking at that as an outcome. But like, I think like you say, I mean, I shouldn't really say this because I've not reviewed the literature myself in any detail, but from what I hear, there are maybe some issues with how things like effort and intensity are measured. And I yeah, think that's, that's what one of the things that prompted you, and I'm not sure, Jürgen, forgive me, I'm not sure if you collaborated with Steele on this, but Steele recently did the paper on effort 
yeah. a couple of papers on talking about yeah. efforts and training and how do you define that? I'm not sure if you were, were you involved in some of those or? Yeah, in some of those, yeah. yeah. I, I thought I might have saw your name, but I couldn't remember. Um, and, and so maybe, I don't know whether that prompted you guys or, or James to do that, but but clearly it's, it's very coincidental that suddenly all these papers have come out regarding effort. <laughs> Yeah, so, and I think that's really the most important point because um, we can look at volume as much as we want, but um, if we do not define um, intensity of effort, I mean, looking at volume and nothing else but volume is completely invalid because let's say somebody is working in a factory and he does a certain movement 100,000 times a week. If you If you look at the volume that this person has done, you know, like if you work in a post office and you, you, you lift envelopes and put them into shelves and so on, at the end of the week, you have, you have moved tons of, of, of paper. But does it mean that you will grow muscles? Or look at the, you work as a postman and you walk, I don't know, 30,000 steps a day. Can you walk, can you run a marathon? No, because that's completely different. The intensity of effort. Training threshold, what I call training threshold, is something that must always be kept in mind because if the intensity of effort is too low, then you can do all the volume you want. If an exercise is useless because the intensity of effort is too low, then you can do this exercise as often as you want. One, if the effect is zero, then 100 times zero is still zero. Um, you need to stimulate something in your muscle, and you only do that if you apply enough intensity of effort. I think this is common knowledge. And we always have to, I mean, as I said before, we can absolutely compare different sets of volume if intensity of effort is comparable. Then there's something to be learned from that. But as long as, you know, somebody... Uh, let's, interprets going to failure very differently from somebody else and you put together the data and compare the data, that doesn't help us in any way. Yeah, I mean, hopefully the papers that have been published uh, and that you've been um, collaborated on uh, with regard to efforts and definitions and things like that, hopefully that will serve to inform future research, um, future you know meta-analyses that uh, compare studies that actually control for these variables better. That would be really, really interesting to see. Um, I think a lot of us in high intensity trading believe we know what the outcomes are going to be, but you know, if you're going to stay scientific, you've got to be able to show it in science. So, uh, otherwise it's just, uh, it's just, um, uh, you know, um, speculation, I suppose. Um, Jürgen, I've enjoyed this so much. It's a real pleasure to talk to you and, uh, pick your brains. I'd love to do this again at some point. Um, I'd love to hear, you know, have you got any last, anything you haven't mentioned that you really want to or would have liked to um, on, the, on the topic of high intensity training that you think might be valuable to those listening? Um, all I want to say is continue with your podcast. I really like that. <laughs> and uh, what I also like is that you also invite people who are not from the high intensity training camp, as I would call it. Because uh, I think there's a lot to be learned from, from discussion and from, I mean, I, I like reading these papers and meta-analysis about multiple set training because I think there's always something to be learned from that. And, um, you know, I like this scientific disco uh, discourse and, uh, you know, exchanging opinions with other people and see what, um, yeah, there's always something to be learned from that. You're right, always learning. And um, I think... You know, I, I've had that a few times. People say I like the fact that you get on the opposing views or other opinions, um, which I haven't done recently as much. Uh, probably because I'm a little bit scared. But I, I also, um, I also would be, you know, my, my own biggest critic. But I, I could have done a much better job, I think, with some of those discussions because um, I, as has been pointed out by. Uh, <laughs> people who've been on the show i don't always do the best job of reviewing all of the literature and um, the research which is 
Um, certainly something I'm better at now uh, and because I'm a little bit better at understanding the papers. But back when I interviewed people like Brad and James, I think I could have done a better job by actually understanding their positions better. Um, and, uh, and maybe that would create more of a, a fruitful conversation. Um, but, but no, I'm, I'm looking forward to doing more podcasts like that with the likes of people like Brad and James. You know, I do try and follow their work as closely as possible. Um, and other people uh, on that side of things, you know, on the, I guess more, you know, quote unquote, high, high volume um, training advocates. You know, I, I, I want to get more of those people on to understand where they're coming from because it's, it's understanding the difference between the, t- the different groups is where you really can um, learn something new. Which, which is pretty awesome. So um, what's the best way, Jürgen, for the, the listeners to find out more about you, get hold of your book, contact you if you're up for that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not on social media much. Um, That's a good thing. <laughs> the, if, <laughs> if people want to get into contact with me, it's best to write an email. Uh, um, what's your email address? Do you mind? or You don't have to yeah. announce that, actually. So yeah, it's really up to you. It's it's Giesing G I E double S I N G at uni U N I minus hyphen uh, Landau L A N D A U dot D E. Excellent, and uh, that will be available in the show notes, obviously, for those that um, are driving or cycling or walking the dog right now, whatever you might be doing. Um, and to find the, the blog post for this episode, guys, please go to corporatewarrior.co forward slash Jürgen. That's J U R G E N. Uh, and there you'll find the show notes, Jürgen's email, all the studies that have been mentioned, uh, all the resources, and Jürgen's book as well. High intensity training will be listed there too. And to find a full list of episodes, please go to corporatewarrior.co forward slash podcast. And until next time, guys, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that. Before you head off, head on over to corporatewarrior.co forward slash ebook to get a bunch of goodies, including number one, a free ebook of podcast transcripts with some of my top guests like Dr. Doug McGuff, Drew Bay and Bill Day Simone on how to optimize muscle gain, fat loss and overall health in an efficient, effective and sustainable way. Number two, a free high intensity training business checklist to help you get more clients in your business. And number three, a free high intensity training Google sheet to help you track and improve your training progress. Head on over to corporatewarrior.co forward slash ebook now and enter your email address for instant access. This episode is brought to you by ARX, the most innovative, efficient, and effective all-in-one exercise machines I have ever seen. I was really impressed with my ARX workout. The intensity and adaptive resistance was unlike anything I've ever experienced. I love how the machine enables you to increase the negative load to fatigue target muscles more quickly. And I love how the workouts are effortlessly quantified. The software tracks maximum force output, rate of work, total amount of work done and more in front of you on screen, allowing you to compete with your previous performance to give you and your clients real-time motivation. The ARX uses a computer-controlled motor to give you the exact amount of resistance your clients need 100% of the time. This means that the resistance can never become dangerous, is intuitive and simple to use, and can provide you with all of the results you and your clients are looking for in a fraction of the time. ARX is highly effective and efficient in delivering all of the benefits of exercise, including increased strength, muscle mass, cardiovascular conditioning, bone mineral density, and injury recovery. As well as being utilized by many high-intensity trainers to deliver highly effective and efficient workouts to their clients, ARX comes highly recommended by world-class trainers and brands, including Bulletproof, Tony Robbins, and Ben Greenfield Fitness. To find out more about ARX and get $500 off install when you place an order, please go to arxfit.com and mention Corporate Warrior and How Did You Hear About Us field. So again, to get $500 off install when you order, head on over to arxfit.com and into Corporate Warrior and How Did You Hear About Us field.